Hi, I'm Marge Charmley, and I'm from St. Paul. Welcome to Buy Cities, a program by, for, and about the Buy Plus community and our friends and allies. Uh, my co-host, Dr. Anita Kozan, is not able to be here tonight, but she will be joining us for future shows. As always, I'm really thrilled to uh, bring to you a wonderful guest tonight. And the guest that we're having to start us off is someone that I've known for over 50 years. We go back a ways, and I'm proud to call her a friend and an ally. Not an ally, well, an ally to the bees, because the G and the L and the bees and all of us are allies to each other. But my, our first guest tonight is B.J. Metzger. And B.J. has been a longtime lesbian advocate and social justice advocate here in the Twin Cities, the Bi Cities. And she will be talking to us about queer history or GLBTQIA history in Minnesota and St. Paul. So welcome, B.J. Well, thank you. It's welcome good to be back. here. Yes, thanks. So yeah, we go back a ways, don't we? We sure do. Alexander yes. Ramsey High School. High school. Back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. High school basketball. High school basketball. That's High school right. Basketball. That's right. Yeah. You yep. were a good guard. I was. I, I frustrated the hell out of you. you I did. know that. You <laughs> I did. know that. But it worked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it worked. Very in your face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was in that. I should have fallen out, but you know. <laughs> Somebody wanted me to guard you, I guess. So. I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we got well, started. Well, the other ones were scared. Let's just, let's well, be they real. They were intimidated. Afraid Everybody was afraid. afraid of you. You know, <laughs> BJ would be, we were, we didn't have women's basketball back then. You know, we were of that era that they didn't have it. So yeah. we had to play in gym. Yeah. And BJ would uh, get the basketball and the waters would part. So she would just walk right up and drop it in. And you scored like about 36 points in a couple minutes. So finally, the phi ed teacher said, Marge, get over here. Because we were on the same team. And then I didn't score anymore. And you didn't score anymore because she said, you have to guard that woman over there. Yep. <laughs> so, so off we went. Yep. Yeah. So we've known each other since high school. Since high school, yep. since band, too. Yes, yeah. And there are many stories we could tell about that. The, indeed. <laughs> but let's start with, uh, you know, we've, we've got the yearbook here. Yeah. So we have to be careful. But there is a story you talked about your start. My start as a political activist go. and as a, an open lesbian were both at about the time this picture was All taken. Right. We're waiting for, here we go. So BJ is right here. Yeah. Got to get the light shining. There, there I am. And there you are. Tell us about the picture, BJ. Well, the picture is in the gym. Um, the teachers were not allowed to strike at that point in time, and uh, they weren't getting paid, and they were trying to negotiate, and there was a lot of her back and forth, and they decided that the only thing they could do was not do extracurricular activities, which meant no football, no yearbook, no band, no anything. No choir, yeah. And uh, no choir, no nothing. So uh, <clears throat> the students took it upon themselves to push the two sides to meet. And the way we did it was by closing the school on a Friday and on a Monday. On Saturday, we met with the school board and said, we're going to close the school every day until you lose your federal funding or settle this. And they didn't believe us. And on Monday, we walked out and closed the school. And on Tuesday, they signed contracts. <laughs> so it was my first big political rally and political acti activism that worked. Well, it not only worked, but there's a backstory on there that I was a witness to, so I just have to tell it. All right. So Ramsey High School was probably had about 1,500 students, and they were in negotiations, and every morning we'd get called into the gym to get an update on what was happening with the teachers and their yep. Yep. contract. Yep. And you were up on the podium with the principal, and all of a sudden they gave us the update. We were all sent back to class. Yep. And then all of a sudden we're asked to come back to the gym, like 1,500 students in the gym. Right. We don't know why we're there, right. but the principal thought that he would, you know, encourage us all to go back to class because right. there are a few stragglers, yep. you know, that weren't yep. going to go back to class. So he's going to use peer pressure. So, <laughs> so what he does, Curtis Johnson, the principal, is standing at the podium, and he wants you as a student body leader to tell all of us to go back to class. Yep. You grab the megaphone from him and you say, all right, we're going to have a sit-in. <laughs> and everything stops still. Yeah. And he looked like he was going to have a heart attack yeah. right then and there. Yeah. And, they and brought, you shut the school down. In an hour, they brought the buses and we all went home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that was Friday. Yeah. 
then we met with the school board. We did it again on Monday, and on Tuesday it was resolved. Yep, yep. <laughs> and after that, there are many other things. But you're here to talk well, about... And, and the other yeah. thing, leading right into yeah. gay history, yeah. I was outed about a week, around either a week before or after that picture. Okay. I was outed at Ramsey because um, somebody saw me kiss my girlfriend in the student council office. All right. And then the, the word went out that I was a lesbian, which is why they decided to elect me princess for the homecoming. All right, yeah. Cause but the, so, the, so I was outed, and I did my first political action within the same, like, week. <laughs> yeah, so you ran basically what was the anti-homecoming yeah, queen contest. Yeah, exactly. And I think you got elected. Everybody but, thinks yeah, I won. Yeah, yeah. But, but they wouldn't let me they, win. They wouldn't let so you they, win. They so. gave it to the, the, well, the head cheerleader, of yeah, course. Yeah, of course. Who was dating the football captain. So, yeah, of, of yeah. course. But you ran a good campaign. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. It was very fun. Yeah. So you came out feisty in that. You got your, uh, you, you got your, cut your teeth at Ramsey there with. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And it didn't take long. I went off to college with my high school sweetheart. All right. Um, and then um, after our relationship broke up and I came back home, I wasn't here for more than a couple, maybe two years, and I was thrown, kind of thrown into the lesbian community in, um, in Minneapolis. We didn't really have a community in St. Paul yet. It was the mid-70s, 76, and in 77, in the, in the, the fall of 77, um, the right the, the right wing churches here circulated a petition to repeal the human rights ordinance for gay people. In St. That Paul. election was in the spring of 78 yep. in St. Paul. And so that fall in 77 was when I first began really working on lesbian issues publicly as a political activist. And back then, there were, you know, maybe gay and lesbian, but there weren't the bisexual, the trans. Oh, I mean, no. That took a long time. Well, to no, get and actually, the we all talked about putting the L in. Yeah. Because everything was gay. It was right. gay community services, gay house, gay this, gay that, and there was no L. So we all talked about we need to put the L in. It took us about two years, and then people were calling it gay and lesbian. And then right away, as soon as we started getting people used to that, we just we all sort of collectively agreed that no we have more groups that need to be included and we don't want to just include everybody under the word gay right. so lgbt which was glbt for a long time uh -huh. except women kept saying i don't want to be called a giblet uh -huh. and the the mainstream media decided they liked LGBT better, so that's what it now is. <laughs> amen. Yes, amen. Amen, amen. <laughs> we, so. we won by default. <laughs> won by default. Well, yeah. you know. But but and now it has, of course, the Q and the I and the A, and 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 I think we should just keep adding instead of going strictly to queer, which a lot of people would like to do, but. Some of us older people don't want that word, and so I think it's good that we have the entire yeah, alphabet well, we soup have, we in have our it name. All there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you came back to the Twin Cities or the Bi Cities, and you got involved in that yep. uh, campaign. Yes, and I got involved in '77 in that campaign. All right. And yeah. what happened on April 25th, 1978? Uh, the uh, gay people were taken out of the human rights ordinance in yeah. St. Paul by popular vote. We yeah. lost two to one. Yeah. So. It was a bad. It was a bad loss. Two to one was and a big, big loss. That was an era when Anita Bryant and all these people, yep. anti-gay folks, were going yep. around the United States finding cities that yes. had charters that allowed for initiative and referendum. Right. Minneapolis did not have that in their city That's charter, right. so right. they weren't in danger right. of losing the same human rights ordinance that yeah. we had exactly. in St. Paul because we got them about the same time. Exactly. Yeah. And it took us forever to get it replaced, but when we replaced it in the end of the 80s and 1990, um, we always said, well, we actually have the better language now because we were forced to make new language and we created the sexual orientation language. Prior to that, the Minneapolis language may still to this day be sexual preference. Yeah, well, and everybody's preference, clear, yeah. preference is not the right word. Yeah. It isn't a preference. Uh -huh. Um, but Minneapolis was stuck with that language because if they opened it up to change, they then could be voted down. 
but there wasn't any way for the public to raise petitions and get it voted down. So in some ways, losing it helped us develop the state of the art language that's still current language today. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I don't know if we wanna go there now, jump that far ahead or go back to your timeline well, here. Well, my timeline, I, I have a timeline in props. I brought okay, props, all right, I, brought, you have props. I brought items from history. And my timeline is, is kind of de demonstrated in these buttons, which I don't know if you can see. The very first one being something that says, we won't talk. And it has FBI at the top and grand jury. Well, this was from 1975, when lesbians in Minneapolis discovered that their phones were being tapped by the FBI, who were investigating us for being pinkos. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and so these buttons were sold to, to try to raise people's awareness that, that we were, we had made it on the radar of the FBI. All in, right. in the Minneapolis lesbian community, all like 26 of us. In yeah, the, right, uh, right, that were all. Uh, we were these big deal pinkos that were gonna cause all kinds of trouble. So that was the first one. And then this is the Boycott Florida Citrus, which comes with Anita Bryant. Right, right. And this yep. was the, the first really big gay demonstration in the Twin Cities was at the fruit, the fruit exchange over on like trans, tran, behind the university, back behind the university, they, there was a big fruit exchange and they had a big thing where she was gonna come and open this fruit business. And it was the first big gay demonstration. We had several hundred people there wanting to boycott Florida Citrus, which oh. eventually became a pretty big national big deal. Was that the one where she got the pie in the face? She got the pie in the face, yeah. yeah. Some yeah. gay activist came yeah, with well, the pie in the face. Yeah, uh, well, Tom Higgins did that. But okay. I don't know. I think we can say that out loud now, I'm not okay. sure. Okay. <laughs> oh, but, I see. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's well, probably... Well, several of us kind of knew who did that, but for years and years, everyone agreed that no one spoke his name. Yeah, so there was Anita Bryant with pie in the face, you know, saying, was, well, let Lord pray for these people. We, we also <laughs> did the... Pie the in my face. We also did the... Bishop, the Catholic, a Catholic, a Catholic Archbishop, I think, got pied the same year. He, he got it too. Huh? Yeah, I think there All were right. there were a couple of really big pieings that happened okay. here. They, they <laughs> the, were the, the pie same, was flying. The huh? same small group of gay men that did <laughs> okay. them both. In my timeline, then we move on to the National March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights. This was slated to be in October of 1979. We lost the the Human Rights Ordinance right. in 78, and everyone was angry and wanted to do something, so we decided to march on Washington. So we had that, and I also brought this item, which is from that exact same march. A lot of people don't realize that the March on Mar Washington that happened in the 80s actually started in Minnesota in 1979 as a response to the repeal in 78 of the St. Paul Ordinance. So that National March on Washington then started in Minnesota. In Minnesota. Yeah. In 1979. We, we didn't we weren't successful getting the getting it done, but we started it, raised a lot of funds and passed all of our materials and the people working on it on to the group that eventually did do it. So, it did indeed start here in Minnesota. Yes. Right. As, as a response to the St. Paul repeal. All right, so some good stuff came yeah. out of the St. Paul repeal. Yeah, yeah. St. Paul is a very has a has a real interesting place in national gay history. It really does. This little T-shirt is from Foxy's, which was a lesbian-owned bar in St. Paul in the 70s and 80s. Um, the two women that owned this bar then went on to own a couple of other bars in St. Paul. It was a place where we did political organizing. Mm -hmm. And the gay men didn't like it when we met there because they had to walk past the bar dykes uh. <laughs> to get to the back room where we had our meetings. And the bar dykes would kind of harass the young gay men that came in. And, but they got, they got used to it. All and right, we did okay. it for many, many years. The women who owned it were very good about giving us space and somewhere to, to be to organize things and to work on issues. So that, that was great. And then, um, of course, going back to my timeline, the gay vote is an early button. This, the pink triangle, was before the flag. Before the gay flag came out, which is on the no repeal button, 
We used pink and black triangles in, in Nazi Germany. The women had black triangles okay. and the men had pink. Um, but then once the flag came out, the pink triangle kind of fell away. As and that a, was to designate people that were gay or gay lesbian. Gay or lesbian, yeah, okay, right. Triangles. And they were yeah. in the camps uh, yep. as homosexuals for right. either men or women. And then I also included two buttons from Paul Wellstone because I don't think a lot of people realize that without the gay community, Paul Wellstone probably never would have been a senator. He may not ever have been accepted uh, by the DFL. So that, that's kind of the timeline. All right. The uh, no repeal is, of course, the 1990 campaign, the 1990, campaign 90s. Right, yeah, yeah, which, yeah. Uh, we, we named it that because I told everybody, well, we're going to have an election every year in the 90s until we win, so you might as well vote for us the first time. And the back story <laughs> on that is a start story that we started telling about for years after the uh, 1978 repeal, we didn't have human rights protection in St. Paul. So then you and I were on the Human Rights Commission, yes. and in 1989 we reintroduced the ordinance. Right. Yes. And we called it sexual orientation and in the definition we sneaked in gender identity. Yes. So the public, of course, it went on the ballot. Yes. That was 89, it went on the ballot in 1990. Yes. And, uh, no, the city council voted for it in 1990. Yes. And then it went on the ballot in 91. Right. And what happened? Well, we won. We won. Two to one. Two to one, a, just a, the opposite. An exact reversal of the loss in 78. And I remember George Latimer, Mayor George Latimer, saying, do you really think we changed any minds? And I, all I could say was, well, of course. You, you don't go from two to one against to two to one for without yep. changing minds. Yep. So obviously we changed minds in the And that was a huge, huge, huge grassroots campaign. It was. And you it were was, pretty active in that. I was actually the, I was, I was um, what I would call now the CEO the chief, or even the CEO, the chief executive officer. They asked me if I would run this campaign and I said only if I have command decision that, and that I decide what goes on and everybody who works for me has their area and they have command of their area but I have the final say. Because I, I had just gone through Karen Clark's campaign r trying to run a political campaign on consensus agreement. Oh boy, yeah. And you cannot be in a political convention that's counting votes and counting for who's got a quorum when you have consensus agreement. Karen Clark literally took her entire campaign off the floor of the convention to make a decision and left them with a quorum. And we were there going, Karen, all they have to do is call a German and you're all done. Because you took all your people. You don't do politics by consensus. So you, you led that campaign. I led that campaign. We prevailed and then 600 two volunteers. Later. Yep, two Over years 600 later. volunteers on that campaign. That made St. Paul Human Rights Ordinance the strongest one in the nation. And and it's what the it's what I have it's time Minnesota's right. button on here. here. It's time Minnesota when when they started up called and asked me if they could use all of our campaign materials and I said, "Well, the gay flag is public domain. Anybody can use that. Mm -hmm. You so don't want to use ours. Ours out. says no repeal. Yeah. You want something that says what you're doing, and yeah. so they came up with the It's Time campaign, which was phenomenal. Yeah. Really big, very successful. The, the buttons were everywhere, and it, it pa they finally were able to pass it. But we had always been told, we, we lobbied the state legislature every single year after 78 for a statewide bill, and they always told us, until you can prove that St. Paul has changed its mind, we are not voting for this. Two to one in favor, St. Paul changed its mind, and it, within two years we had it passed at the state legislature. And the state used the same language that we had in St. Yep, Paul, they which did. you and I sat in a little room and, and, and I've discovered with a since of the city then that there, there are at least a half a dozen cities that have used our language. Yeah. You know, and I, I think one state since, since ours that yeah. has used Minnesota's language. Mm -hmm. So it's, Minnesota has always been. A leader in the national movement. Um, it, it, Saint Paul, Minnesota was at one time um, the third largest 
gay community in the country. Wow. In New York, San Francisco, Minneapolis. I kind of think Atlanta might be right there with us now. Okay. So we might be third or fourth, and they're third or fourth, and I'm not sure. But we're still, I, I would say, in the top four. Well, and we still have one of the largest gay pride celebrations yes. in the nation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the best. And one of the best, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, by I still like Rochester's too, though. You like Rochester's that one, Rochester's huh? is really good. <laughs> well, what have we missed along the way? We've got about five minutes. To... Oh, left to talk. Yeah. Well, um, oh, I brought this one. You are uh, ahead of your and time. And I'm giving BJ. this to you. Okay. This is the. This is um, the issue is not gay marriage. The issue is equality. And, I, and this is a T-shirt that I, that Lori Dockin and I had made up. All right. Um, pre, before the marriage fight was really underway. Yeah. Um, but I, everything that I ever did was about equality. Uh -huh. It wasn't about human rights coverage. Uh -huh. It was about equality. Yeah. It isn't about marriage. It's about equality. All. It isn't about adoption. It's about equality. Yep. Yep. You know, and so when they called me and asked me if I wouldn't be proud to have my name on the wall of tolerance, I said, don't put my name anywhere near anything called the wall of tolerance. And for, I don't want to be tolerated. I want to be equal. Right. I want to be equal. It's and about tell, equality. Tell our audience what the wall of tolerance is. Well, it, it was, I don't even know if they really built this thing, but they were, it was, it was in the... I got to say, somewhere in the 90s when they decided, somebody decided to build a monument to early gay organizing, and they wanted it called the Wall of Tolerance. And we were, well, I was supposed to be honored to have my name on it. Truth be told, I was supposed to pay $1,000 yeah, right, to have course. my name yeah, like on the Wall of America. Tolerance. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I, I honestly, I don't think it was gay people that put it together. I think it was some liberal person somewhere in the Midwest decided to do a monument. And I don't think it was ever built. I think a lot of people said, eh, no, it's not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> so that is my timeline through the ages. That's your timeline through the ages, and you were a big part of it. And, uh, and, and I, was, I knew you when. Well, you, and you no, you, we maybe have a minute left. Marge Charmley is the person who wrote the language we're talking about. She sat in a room with a bunch of straight people and knocked out the language over, I don't know, how many hours of work. Yeah. And you were the lead person on getting that language through the Human Rights Commission, which recommended it to the city council, which passed it, and then we defended it. So you were the starting point for that whole thing. Well, you know, it was because of my background in psychology. That was, you know, what we call sexual orientation. We built in sexual and gender identity. So, you know, there we were. We became the first city in the nation to protect people on the basis of gender identity, and Minnesota followed suit. So, St. Paul still has a large transsexual community of people who moved here to work on the campaign. Oh, sure. Yep. Right. Yep. So. How are we doing for time? 30 seconds or three minutes? Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Oh. Well, we have a lot of time. Okay, so can we I... We could just dirt in 30, three minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, could... we won't, though. So there's a story I, I have to tell. Okay. I mean, see, I, I've been so lucky to watch you over the years. All right. Th this goes back to the early 80s. All right. And we were all, the community was trying to get affirmative action in the St. Paul Police and Fire Departments, uh -huh. which were predominantly white men then. Uh-huh. So the Equal Opportunities Coalition, which Roy Garza headed, and I was the vice chair, and we were all there. So uh -huh. we're in the city council chambers, and I know you remember this day. Uh -huh. So the city council chambers in St. Paul are packed. packed. I mean, packed to the gills. On half the side are the St. Paul police and fire, all white men. On the other side, we, <laughs> we had women, we had people of color, we, we had us all over there. And everybody took their turns going up to the microphone about getting affirmative action passed. And one of the firefighters, Dennis Kessler. Dennis Kessler, walks up to the microphone. And he's got this guy standing next to him. Muscle bone little boy, yeah. Muscle bone, yep. And Kessler takes this guy, throws him over his shoulder, yep. and he said, and the reason we shouldn't have affirmative action is because there's not a woman in the room that can do this. And all of a sudden, everybody went quiet. And we looked, and there in the back of the city council, 
you stood up. That's all I did? That's all you did. You stood up. Put, put my hands this, on my fist. And you gave him the stink eye. I mean, you glared at Dennis Kessler, and everybody there knew that you could throw Dennis Kessler over your shoulder. The so. whole room burst out laughing. Yeah, yeah. It was, and Bur including the city council. The whole city council burst out laughing. We passed it. The f we have women firefighters now. And people of color. Yep. yep. From that day on. Yep, from that day on. So Dennis I, that Kessler. was hilarious. And I Ron remember Maddox, I went up to him afterwards and I said, Dennis, it's called the fireman's carry. And I learned it in junior lifeguard in ninth grade. Yeah. And I could do it in ninth grade. And we knew you could do it. So we knew you could do it. Yeah. How are we doing? One minute. So okay. BJ, it's, it's always a delight to see you. And, and it's good to have this memorialized now too, because you have been such a force to reckon with <laughs> ever since day one. Well, that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, a force to be <laughs> reckoned with, and, and you're such an integral part in terms of what you've done, and I don't think you've gotten enough um, accolades over the years oh, well, thank for you. the role that you played, and you're savvy in political organizing, because we would not have these ordinances now, and the state of Minnesota would not have it had you not decided to be the commander for <laughs> thank you, <Commander laughs> no <Susan>. repeal. <laughs> <laughs> so, it worked. <laughs> you probably don't remember. You've been on the show before, but do you remember our signature goodbye where we look at camera over oh, there? Oh, and we say something. We say, bye for now. Of course, bye, bye for now. For now.